serving his country. A veteran of eight combat campaigns, he earned 21 awards and decorations. 15 years a paratrooper, he served in the elite special forces, the Green Berets. Just a few weeks after the assassination, he volunteered for specialist guerrilla training at Fort Bragg. Almost all of the instruction in the guerrilla warfare school was classified. Uh, the most secret was the top secret training on assassinations and terrorism. And at that time, we went to a different building that had a double uh, barbed wire fence around it and, and guard dogs. At. On the John F. Kennedy situation, that was uh, brought to our attention as a classic example of the way to organize a, a complete uh, program to eliminate a nation's leader uh, while pointing the finger at a lone assassin. It involved also uh, the cover-up uh, of the assassination itself. We had considerable detail. They had a, a, a mock layout of the, the plaza in that area and showed where the shooters were and, and where the routes were to the hospital. I don't remember where those were now. They had quite a bit of movie uh, film coverage. It seemed like, you know, thinking back to that time, and some still photos of the, the grassy knoll and, and places like that. They told us that um, Oswald was not involved in the shooting at all. He was the patsy. He was the one that was set up. We did, uh, myself and a friend of mine, form a very distinct impression that the CIA was involved in Kennedy's assassination. During a coffee break, we overheard one of the CIA instructors say to the other, things really did go well in Daly Plaza didn't it, or something to that effect. And that just reinforced or really added to our suspicions, and, and we really felt uh, before the end of the training was over that one of those instructors may have been involved himself in the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Uh, I had to do a lot of rethinking, uh, and, and perhaps, it's a, perhaps it's a way that soldiers of fortune are, I don't know, but I just then convinced myself, as did my friend, that it had to somehow be in the best interest of the United States government that Kennedy was killed. Otherwise, why would our own people have done it? Simple as that. At Fort Bragg, 15 months after his training, Dan was summoned to meet an official from the CIA, a company man. David Vanick, a fellow officer in assassination training, also attended. First, the company man took me aside and showed me his badge, his ID card, and he asked me if I would volunteer to kill a man, a United States citizen, a naval officer. Uh, he didn't tell me who it was at first. Now, I assumed what he was talking about was killing a man overseas. He asked me at first if I would accept an assignment to kill somebody. He didn't give me the name, but then I asked for the name, assuming it would be, like I said, overseas. And he gave me the name, William Bruce Pitcher. Hard name to forget, really, once you hear it. And so uh, I told him yes. And, and then he said, we well, have to, um, he started to lay out the details of it. And the details included the fact that I would have to get him before he retired. And he retired in a very short period of time, if I remember correctly, and he was stationed at Bethesda Naval Hospital. So I'd have to actually get him here in the United States. Well, I refused because that wasn't the way that that we were trained that this was going to happen. We were supposed to be used as their assets, the CIA's assets, for use in assassinations overseas. In the United States, the mafia was supposed to supply what resources they need for killing somebody here in the United States. So he then asked David Vanek. He went over to David Vanek and talked to him. Now, I don't know what he talked to David Vanek about. He might ask him the price of ice cream. I don't know. but. I never saw David Vanek after that day. Now, that was in August, the first week of August of 1965. In November 1963, William Bruce Pitzer was head of the audiovisual unit at Bethesda Naval Hospital. A close colleague at the time was a young petty officer, Dennis David. Three or four days after the assassination, I walked in to his office and I saw he was working on some uh, film. He had a movie editor. Well, there's reel to reel, it runs across to the screen. And he showed it to me, and it was a 16 millimeter film of the autopsy. There were also some slides. He had some slides that he had uh, that showed uh, 
of tissue slides and also showed some slides of, of President Kennedy uh, that were taken while, uh, from, while he was on the uh, table at the morgue. And, uh, you know, we looked at him, uh, kind of horrified, I guess you would say, at the seriousness of the wound. But I remember one of the things that I remembered uh, was that we saw, they had a, a picture of Kennedy laying on the table, and it was a front profile, if you will, or front view. And the only thing we saw was a little hole about here in the temple. And uh, then and some, and another photograph, or another uh, slide that Bill had, uh, was saying, showed a huge gaping hole here in the back. And so Bill and I logically assumed that uh, the wound was a frontal entry wound. That, uh, as opposed to what the Warren Commission later said, being a, uh, shot from behind. Dennis left Bethesda for a new posting, but in November 1966, a colleague gave him some distressing news regarding his old friend Bill Pitzer. He'd been found dead in a pool of blood in his studio at Bethesda. The official verdict was suicide. Lying face down on the floor, a 38 revolver by his side, he had a bullet wound in the right temple. When the occupational therapist had told me this, I remember I reminded him, you know, that doesn't make a hell of a lot of sense because Bill was left-handed, and you know, uh, because we used to kid him all the time when playing bridge about being a southpaw, because sometimes he'd deal in reverse instead of dealing him in the correct uh, sequence, he'd deal him in the opposite way, and we'd, we'd kind of harass him about it. There are grave doubts about Pitzer's alleged suicide. His left hand had been so mangled as if tortured that his wedding ring could not be removed and given to his widow. Bill had told me shortly before I had he left Bethesda, which was around the 7th of December of 65, uh, he told me that he was planning on retiring because he had enough time in and he was wanting to get out. And that he also said he, he had some damn lucrative offers from uh, some TV networks. And uh, other, other people have asked me why I think he was assassinated. And, and I think it was because that with him retiring, they were, uh, they, and I don't know who they are, were afraid that he would take these f pictures that he and I had seen, this 35 millimeter and the uh, 16 millimeter film, that he was, that he would take them and that the, uh, if he went to work for a major studio, that they would use them or he would have them aired and that would really, you know, blow some people out of the water if that would have transpired. I could be wrong, I could be all wet, but I do know those films exist because I was there, I saw the damn things. I, I am absolutely certain that the name that I was given underneath those pine trees in Fort Bragg, North Carolina in the first week of August was William Bruce Pitcher. I put it completely out of my mind from 1965 until 1993. And I was watching a special in November 93 about the assassination of Kennedy. I think it was, an, it was a special by Jack Anderson. And at the end of that special on the television, they rolled a, a list of 42